mesdames et messieurs, ça fait grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today. And um, I'm really excited that JUMP is leading the world, I think, in the discussion of a, a vital issue, absolutely vital issue that we're addressing here together this morning. And I'm going to begin uh, with the fact that uh, Aneva presented to us uh, just a little bit earlier. Uh, and this is the prompt, really, to this session today on the female economy. As Aneva told us earlier, women in the world are an army of consumers that have between them a buying power equal to trillions of dollars each year. And that is equal to the GDPs of several large companies uh, and countries. This is a, a known fact because Anya introduced us to it earlier. But in the rest of my presentation, I may be presenting you with some information that you've never come across before. And I would urge you to take this information out into the world and help achieve the change that Monica and Genevieve said that we all need collectively to push towards. So with this in mind, I'd like to introduce you to a breakdown of women's buying power by sector. So across all sectors, as you can see here in this diagram, women are responsible for 83% of all purchases. And you can see that that's higher in certain sectors, for example, in beauty care, in, in um, several other sectors, groceries, food purchasing, women's buying power is massively in excess of the 83%. If we uh, look at the French situation, we can see that women uh, are close to 50% of the labour market in full-time work. And uh, if we just look at the uh, automobile sector, women are 50% of motorists and they're buying 30% of new cars. So in a non-traditional area like motoring, even there, women in France have enormous pedal power. And what do most women think in their role of purchasing as well about what they're actually being offered? Well, I'm afraid this isn't a particularly good news story, um, as you will see from the uh, results of surveys from all around the world. Uh, this first result is fairly typical, I'm afraid. Women don't think that manufacturers have them in mind in the design of the products that they create. Uh, neither do they think that advertisers have them in mind. And we could go on survey upon survey upon survey shows that the women are not satisfied with what they're being offered. So we've looked at who's doing the buying, and we said it's an army of women who are doing the buying, who is actually configuring the products and the advertising aimed at these women. Well, this may be another surprise story for you. Here are the figures of who's actually doing most of the design. Very hard to get these figures. These are membership figures, as close as I could get, to a professional society of designers in the UK, also based, uh, based internationally. And if you just flick down that, and I've put some membership status figures in there with some fellows who will be more senior members, the, the main message to take away from these figures is that women constitute a growingly small proportion of those who are responsible for design and design management. They are quite strong at entry levels, as you can see with graphic designers, but they decline as you move up to fellow levels. And by the way, the figures for web design uh, emerged from a study I conducted because there were no figures whatsoever telling us who was responsible for web design, but it is predominantly men. And if we move on to look at the picture for advertising, you can see it's a very, very similar picture demographically with men both in the UK and the US responsible for most creative sides of advertising. Um, I've got some figures for France there at the bottom of that table. Um, and you can see that, again, 
if we're looking at decision-making power in France, it's still very largely in the hands of men. Okay, so that's background. Most purchases are women. Most people configuring products and advertising for those women are men. Does this matter? You might say, well, so what? It doesn't matter at all, except perhaps from an ethical standpoint. Well, I think we can only answer this question, does it matter, by looking at the issue which we're going to look at now very briefly, whether what men and women create in the way of designs and what they prefer in the way of the designs are the same or different. If they're the same, well, maybe these demographics don't matter too much. But if they actually differ, then maybe we need to really sit up and take notice. So I'm just going to show you uh, some, uh, a story about women's designs and whether they're the same or different. I began my journey almost 20 years ago looking at this question of whether what men and women design is the same or different. And I went into art schools, and this was the first sample I looked at. The students have been asked to design chocolate boxes. Two on this page are the designs created by females, and I don't know if you'd like to mentally hazard a guess uh, as to which of those were the creations of females, but you might have guessed the two on the right, these circular ones here, are the work of females. You might be noticing they're round, they, they have a lot of detail. The ones on the left, created by men, have more straight lines. The next sample I looked at, um, from the same group of students, same project, uh, which of those are by men? Well, at top right and bottom left are the main ones, straight, very regular, top left, bottom right, more rounded, more wacky, we might say in English, uh, are the work of females. And if you enter the differences into a graph through quite a complicated experiment that I conducted, you can get actually the shape of those designs. So when you're looking at the green line, you're looking at the shape of the male designs, and if you look at the pink line, you're looking at the shape of the female designs. Where you see greatest divergence, for example, um, at the beginning of that graph, you can see quite a lot of divergence here. That's in the area of color. The next area of divergence is um, to do um, with the technicality of the look. So what that experiment showed was that what men and women create in design terms is statistically poles apart. The statistical difference could not have been bigger. Uh, I discovered uh, other studies, as well as other studies I did myself, which helped me systematically define the characteristics that typify designs created by men. And you can see some of the elements there sketched out. Straight lines, dark colors, and few colors, uh, very three-dimensional look, little detailing and quite a serious look. And you contrast that with the kind of designs that typify what women create, and you'll see it's very often opposite features there. And uh, one last point there uh, on that slide, you'll see that very often women will design images of women, and likewise men will tend to design images of men. Lots of explanations for that which we'll come to later. So, just uh, I'm going to show you three uh, separate sets of images to illustrate some of these differences. Uh, this was the basis of another experiment I did. Cookers, there was a, a, a colouring competition. Uh, children were invited to colour in the outline of these cookers. And two of the cookers you can see there were the work of boys and were typical of the boys I found from my analysis. And two turned out to be typical of the way that the girls coloured in the cookers. And I don't know, again, if you'd like to mentally hazard a guess as to which of those two were the work of boys and girls. But you'd be absolutely right if you said that the top two were the work of boys. I wonder why, how you guessed that one. Um, you probably see more homogeneity in the use of colours. Um, a single colour is used for most of the cooker, whereas the bottom one, well, have you ever seen cookers like the ones at the bottom? Uh, you've got the knobs in different colours, you've got the hogs in different colours, just about any part of the cooker that could be is painted in a different colour. And again, I found that these differences in coloration by boys and girls were statistically off the wall, very, very strongly marked. In other words, chance had a very small element in our conclusion. 
that the differences were the result of gender. Uh, here's another set of designs. The one on the left, designed by a team of men, and the one on the right, the work of a female designer. You can see, again, much more regular typeface in the one on the left, more irregular on the right, and much greater use of color variety. And finally, last but by no means least, uh, this is a logo that was used by the main telecoms provider in the UK, British Telecom. And I met the designer, he told me that his brief had been to design a figure that was neither male nor female, but hermaphrodite in color, in, in character. How many of you, hands up, think that, that looks like a gender neutral figure, i.e. neither male nor female? Let's see those hands. Did he do a good job at his brief? I can't see any hands. How many of you think that looks like a man? Interesting, because I carried out a short survey and I found out that 74% of the people I interviewed also thought that looked like a man. So he had a brief to produce something that was neither masculine nor feminine. He didn't follow it, did he? I would say he wasn't malicious. He was just doing what we find that people tend to depict people of their own genders. And maybe this is an act of projection that we do all the time. Maybe this is a factor in the grey areas that Monica talked about uh, in, in gender discrimination. We'll come to that in the round table later. So we've looked at creations. Let's move on to preferences very briefly. Do men and women like the same kind of designs? All important question. And it's very important for four reasons. First of all, our perception of a product will influence our perceptions of other factors, such as its usefulness and usability. It will also determine how much time we spend looking at something, the purpose of most advertising and marketing. It will also, all importantly, affect how much we're prepared to pay for something. So the question of women's and men's design preferences is vastly significant, and I've carried out numerous tests and this is what I have found consistently across most of the tests. And it is that there is a tendency for men to prefer designs created by men and for women to prefer designs created by women. That's a finding you might not have come across before, but it's come across in study after study that I have carried out. For example, recently I carried out a study across five countries one of those was France, and I presented people with pairs of designs to respond to. The Christmas card on the left was the work of a male designer, the Christmas card on the right was the work of a female designer, and I found a massive tendency across the five countries for that own sex preference, men preferring the one on the left, and women the one on the right. I've shown you these already, and similar result emerged from this five-country study. I'm going to show you two websites now. And the first one won't cause many surprises. It's the work of a male designer. And you'll see that it actually isn't dissimilar to most web designs that you see. But the one that I'm going to show you after that, you might have to hold your breath, because that looks very different. It's the work of a female designer. <laughs> So, the one on the right, you don't see them very often, the work of a female um, designer, one on the left, the work of a male. Again, when I ran preference tests on those two, very, very massively strong tendency for men to prefer the one on the left and women to prefer the one on the right. So, we've seen differences in creations, what men and women create, and we've seen differences in what they prefer. Going back to those demographics we looked at originally, we might be beginning to think, well, actually, it, we have a rather interesting situation here with men doing most of the decision-making, women doing most of the purchasing. Could we just ask the men to design in a more female way, perhaps? Well, I think we need to look very briefly at what underlies the differences. And if you dip into the psychology literature, you actually find enormous evidence for differences in the way men and women see. Not only are men more likely to look at stimulus 
in isolation from their environment, that's field independent. Uh, not only that, but they're also um, likely to have much better 3D vision, better targeting accuracy. But on the color stakes, women have the advantage. And there is actually American research that shows that a proportion of women, they put it at 50%, have an additional, a fourth color pigment over men's three. And when you go up from three to four color pigment, you can see from this slide, you're increasing your color vision from being able to see millions of colors to being able to see hundreds of millions of colors, which arguably half of the female population can see. And if you want to delve deeper, uh, and I think my book is available there, a couple of books, um, I go into the fact that actually these differences served us as human beings extremely well over the 99% of human history in which we were hunters and gatherers. Uh, if you think about it, having very good targeting, 3D accuracy vision is very useful if you're trying to hunt prey and bring it home. Um, whereas having very good color vision is very, very helpful if you're picking berries and looking after not just the infant community, but the adult community, which apparently women were doing, they were the managers of the day, because then you can see changes in skin coloration and you can discern the right from the unripe berries. So I think we can rightfully think about women as gatherers, men as hunters. And we live in a world currently where most industry is dominated at senior decision-making levels by hunters, uh, and they're producing products for the army of purchasers who are largely gatherers. What are the implications for organizations? Well, we could spend a whole day, not to say a week, talking about this, but I think that the main points are, first of all, we need to plan. Uh, it may sound obvious, but we do need to start and understand who our demographic is. And I can't tell you the number of companies I've done work for. I won't name them or shame them here today. But they include big, big players in the motor industry and pharmaceutical industries. And they hadn't a clue who they were targeting their products at. So we do need to define our target market. And then we need to audit what we're doing in relation to that target market. And then from there, we need to go on and develop a plan. We need to which we can now, with this new information I've gathered together, we need to, in detail, shape our products around what we know of male and female preferences. And because of what we know about the importance and power of preferences, we can be guaranteed, and I will say that again, guaranteed to increase the bottom line through better targeting. And then finally, of course, as we do with all business activities, we need to sit back and evaluate what we've done, and if necessary, restart the cycle. Um, of course, limited with time today, uh, I've spent a goodly proportion of time, though, putting together a lot of the information in a readable form, so particularly the latest book, very readable stuff. And if, if you'd like to see some of the uh, articles I've written, I've written some short, very readable articles, then please don't hesitate to give me your business card and I'll send you copies to those articles. Thank you very much.